using Brazilian jiu-jitsu for self-defense? That's the number one question I get from a lot of uh, a lot of the viewers. A lot of my viewers, you guys all practice uh, BJJ, and you saw my my take on the problems with ground fighting before. And I think what we need to do now is we need to go to a subject matter expert, which I just happen to have an amazing one. And we're gonna we're gonna learn about not only the history of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but how it applies to self defense. Because there's a there's a little bit of a controversy going on within the Jiu Jitsu world about training for self defense versus training for competition. And I can think of nobody better to bring us that information than Robert Drysdale. Now, before I tell you about Robert Drysdale, just remember um, to stay in touch with us and to get the most information uh, that you can from us. You know making sure that you don't get, you know, if we get deplatformed, uh, we can still give you this type of information. Go to surviveviolence.com. Give us your email. You get a free masterclass right up front. Just hours of really good content, absolutely free. But also by giving us your email address, it guarantees that we can let you know, you know, notify you when new content comes out. We can notify you when there are really good training offers or subject matter experts that you see on the channel if they have things. It's the best way to get your best self-defense information. So do that. Now, today I am bringing on my friend who just happens to live here in Vegas, Robert Drysdale. Now, I met Robert years ago when um, a bunch of my uh, Aussie Special Forces buddies uh, were out here in uh, San Diego for a training, and uh, they trained under Robert. Uh, Robert used to go to Australia and train with them, and um, that's how I originally met Robert. And I had no idea what an amazing story he had. You know, he's an American. He's uh, born to a Brazilian mother and American father. He has immersed himself in both cultures. He went and trained down in Brazil. Um, and he not only did, he's the most successful American grappler uh, to ever compete in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. In one year, he won not only the ADCC, but the IB, uh, BJJF World Championships. Those are the two most prestigious jiu-jitsu tournaments that there are. He also amassed a great uh, MMA record. He understands MMA. He's trained uh, and coached people like Randy Couture, Frank Mir. list goes on. I mean, he's highly, highly accomplished. And the reason I wanted to reach out to him is because he recently read, uh, uh, released a book, Opening the Closed Guard. Now, here's my copy right here. I suggest everybody get this. You can get it on Amazon. Um, it's just outstanding. It's a history of uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu and how it evolved. Now, a lot of you are saying, well, geez, I didn't think, you know, you're, you're not a jiu-jitsu guy. Absolutely. I'm not a jiu-jitsu guy. That's why it's important that when I am going to broach the subject, because you guys have asked me, I'm going to try to get you the best source possible. And again, that's what I like about this channel. This channel is not about just what I do and how I look at self-protection. I want you to find out the best people. So if you want to understand Brazilian jiu-jitsu, how it evolved and how it's used for self-defense and what the challenges are and what the pluses are, there's no better person to listen to than Robert Drysdale. So without further ado, I've split this into four, it's a series of four things because we talk about four distinct things. And um, so they're short, you know, they're, they're about seven, eight minutes. And uh, it's just really good information that you'll get over the next couple of uh, series here. All right, so here we go. Hey everybody, I uh, want to welcome you back to another great interview. A lot of you have been asking about how does your jiu-jitsu training, how do you look at your jiu-jitsu training in regards to self-defense? I happen to have a friend of mine here who is the perfect person to ask, uh, Robert Drysdale. Thanks so much for, for coming. Uh, you've heard of Robert's in the opening, you heard about all Robert's uh, bona fides and where he's at. Um, you know, Robert, I think be really interesting before we even get into the self-defense aspect of it you just had this huge project um you know op well your book is opening the closed guard but then closed guard the documentary that you're putting together which you're still you know going through but what you learned during that time about the history of jiu-jitsu some of the misnomers that people you know assumed yeah. about it and, and its roots um and, and, and even then it's a good idea of you know it originally was was a displayed to the Brazilian community and became a form of self defense, yeah. and how it evolved from there. So just yeah. you know, a thumbnail sketch of what your what your studies were in that in that arena. Well, I started doing some research on the origins of jiu-jitsu in Brazil. It's interesting to see like what actually happened, right? And there wasn't a lot published, to be honest. Like there was like very 
more scientific, academically oriented. A lot of it was just oral tradition and, and a word of mouth kind of thing. And the more I dug, the more like, oh, this story is way better than what I had heard. And, you know, a lot of it was exactly what I had sus suspected. They, what Brazilians did primarily, the Gracie family, is they, they, they had Kodo Kan Judo and they made some adaptations. Now, these adaptations, we can argue why they made these adaptations, right? They couldn't defeat the Japanese and the Japanese rule set, the Judo rule set, or infrastructure in Brazil, which is a hypothesis I put out where because of space in Brazil is so confined for practice, you don't get like big mats like you get in wrestling, you know, or in Judo. They started on their knees, so they became specialists on the ground, right? But what Brazilians added, primarily the Gracie family here, is they kept alive a martial aspect of Judo that died in Olympic Judo, right? So Judo still has a self-defense curriculum, but it's not very, it wasn't emphasized. It was more the sports size it was emphasized. And what they did in Brazil was they're like, you know, like fighting ought to be more a means of learning how to fight and defend yourself than a means of education, which was like primarily Judo's concern, right? And what happened over the years is they became very, very uh, uh, fighting oriented, self-defense oriented. They helped give birth to Vale Tudo, later rebranded MMA, right? Because their whole thing is like, oh, you know how to fight? Okay, let's put it to the test, right? right? Which is something that most martial artists were not doing. We can just argue whether my martial art is better than yours, but there was nothing empirical about it. Well, so these guys created a laboratory. They called it Vale Tudo. Let's put it to the test. You do what you do. I'll do what I want to do. Let's see who wins, right? Over the years, that model was not very successful because it's not very appealing to a broad audience. You can't really make money from it other than the fighters themselves. How do you teach it? Most people don't want to fight for real. Right. The same reason MMA gyms don't do well with beginner programs. You have professional fighters, amateur fighters, but it's your average mom and dad does not want to train MMA. So they created a federation. They followed judo's, uh, the, the judo's footsteps. Right? We're going to federation, a belt system, and we're going to start creating a sport. The thing is the sport aspect grows a lot faster, has a bigger life for your student than the self-defense aspect, right? And so the, so the sport arena kind of took over BJJ. But going back to the original question, like it's, you know, BJJ comes from judo, there's no way around it. But it is, they kept alive a more martial aspect of judo, which over the years has become more like judo, more sport oriented, which is nothing wrong, it's what I like, it's my background. But, you know, some aspects of it have become overly, um, technical and strategical for competition. And I think we lost some of the reality of combat, which is still there for you to practice if you want. It's just not as popular amongst, you know, people in general. Like I always, I always say this, so what gets someone through the door is fitness and self-defense. That's why they want to show up. Right. But what gets them to stay is, you know, community, friendship, the, the endorphins are addicting, right? Like rolling is fun. And they, they get immersed in the culture, the com competition scene. They, they stay in jiu-jitsu for a long time because of those things. Um, but, you know, the, the, the martial side kind of is, I wouldn't say it's dead in jiu-jitsu, it still exists, but it's not as emphasized as it used to be. A lot of those guys have either drifted to some school to still specialize in self-defense, or very few that right. come from jiu-jitsu, or to MMA, which is, you know, kind of in some ways a birth child of jiu-jitsu as well. Yeah, you know, you experience, what's, what's interesting about your background is you, you come from both cultures, you've, yeah. got a, you've got an American dad, a Brazilian mom. Um, you immersed yourself in, in both. You also, from the, from the competition side of things, you not only competed and dominated at the highest levels of jiu-jitsu, you also had an impressive MMA career, so you know both sides of it. Um, I, I, would hear, I would hear complaints from some of my jiu-jitsu friends that the, the, the thing they don't like about MMA is you never get to see the highest level of jiu-jitsu normally because of the striking and, and stuff like that, and that you don't get to see the, tec that the technical aspects of it. And then I'd hear things, like I'd read articles from uh, somebody like a Hicks and Gracie bemoaning the fact that, hey, I don't think there's enough self-defense, I think we've gone too far, yeah. and we've lost that aspect of it. A lot of the people that are watching, um, you know, watching this interview um, are coming in from the idea that, hey, originally, like you said, I want the, I want the self-defense aspect yeah. of things. Um, I think you and I were talking about, unfortunately, there's not a lot of payoff when you, when you train self-defense. I, I noticed on our end of it, yeah. because you're teaching people basically to survive, they're, they're going to have to deal with real violence, and you're going to have to you know, really get, get into it at yeah. that point. And, um, ha, how have you found balancing the two? Well, I, here's the thing, a lot of it is market pressure, right? You're going to get a shorter shelf life of a student that only does self-defense than you are someone who is training more of the competition style. They'll stay longer in the gym, right? From my experience, at least. Um, it's, you know, I, I truly believe in endorphins, the big component. They're highly addictive. 
like when you're training every day and you take a couple of days off. Now I've, I've slowed down a lot of my training. I don't train as much as I used to, but I would get anxiety from not training. And I realized that anxiety was because I wasn't getting that, the, the, the feeling of rolling. Like it, it, it's very addicting, right? And it's fun too. Like it's very, it's like you're playing chess with your body. Like it's so much fun. So I think that really what gets people to stay. But it, it's training self-defense is difficult because first of all, like a real situation has way too many variables. Like it's very like in jujitsu, it's there's there's a framework there, right? Or even in MMA, there's a framework. There's a cage, there's a referee, there are three judges, three five minute rounds. There's a framework, right? When you talk about self defense, what's the framework? How many people are you fighting? Are there guns? Are there knives? How many? Is the grass wet or is it dry? Are you on a slope? Is it a football field or a kitchen? So I mean, the ability to develop a game plan on the spot. Like I think the key component of self defense is thinking very quickly. Like what? What's the best game plan? Because you choose the wrong game plan, right? And you're dead, right? right? And jujitsu, like, the, and this is, a, and I, my, I get you know flack for this in the jujitsu community because I say this, but you know, taking someone down under certain circumstances might be the dumbest thing to do. Right. You're in a nightclub. You want to take someone down? Are you sure that's a good idea? Because there's an assumption there. It's one on one, yeah. right? And I think it has a reflex of Brazilian culture. It's a very machismo culture. So if we fight, we were kids and we fight in school. It was one on one. Like the most embarrassing thing that could happen was one of your friends in your fear to help you or a teacher or your parents. If your parents stepped in to help you, it was like, oh, please don't. Let me get beat up. It was the most embarrassing. It was like a very machismo one-on-one man. But, but that's not true everywhere, yeah. right? If you make that assumption, it's just me and you and there are no weapons involved. Yes, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is a very, very, do- I would argue even more than any other because even wrestling, which is very dominant in UFC, the, the wrestlers, when they first walk into Jiu-Jitsu, they get triangled by 14-year-olds. They have no idea what a guillotine is. So they get guillotined and armbar by 15 years. I've seen it happen, like D1 wrestlers, yeah. right? Give them six months, they can figure it out very quickly and they do exceptionally well in MMA. But one-on-one, I think with, with that framework, no one's gonna interfere. Jiu-Jitsu is very dominant. That being said, that's not the reality of most real situations. You, know, you don't even know how many people you're fighting, right? So factoring not only is very difficult, so creating a system of self-defense that, that caters to all that, to all these variables, is very difficult. You know, so I, I mean, I've had self, I've taught self-defense classes and I always try to stick to the basics of the basics, but it's very difficult to prepare for every situation. What you can do is teach the body how to think and act very quickly. This is why I'm a big fan of what I'm calling judo randori, which is combat, right? Me trying to take you down, you trying to defend the takedown. I try to armbar you, you try to choke me. And then we can start playing games where we have like a plastic knife or a plastic gun and we're trying to mimic a real situation, but you have to have that resistance. So you teach the body how to think quickly. And the problem with that system is it's not a lot, it's not as fun as a competition format. Right. And it's, it, that's what it comes down to. Because if you're gonna be coming to the gym you know, every day for the rest of your life, the next 10 years, whatever, it can't just be about protecting yourself. It's gotta be somewhat fun. Yeah. You know, people like, and most of my students, they walk in the gym with a smile on their face and they walk away with us, they're happy to be there. Okay, so that's part one uh, that, that we're doing with Robert. Um, listen, it's a very straightforward conversation. The guy doesn't hold back at all. Um, and he's very confident in what he, you know, knows about self-defense and what he knows about competition. Uh, the next couple of, of parts, we go more in depth on the self-defense side. Uh, he's got some great in- information uh, for you on that. And then we learn more about the history and the evolution of, uh, of the Valley Tudo and, and lots of other really great traditions. Uh, I really think you're going to like the rest of this series. But again, I wanted to make these short to the point and uh, get, get them out as quickly as possible. For look, so look for part two in the very near future. And also uh, make sure that you, you know, get over to surviveviolence.com, give us your email, and get our free masterclass. You're going to really like it. All the best.